Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I want to thank y'all for being here on this Labor Day weekend. And I just want to start with a couple other announcements. Uh, the first one is an update from Hollis. He is home. Uh, came home yesterday, and it's kind of funny. You know he was feeling better because I texted him and Nelda. I thought he was coming home, so just wanted to check in. And he grabbed her phone and texted while she was driving. Said, we're on our way home. Do you need me to preach for you tomorrow? <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> but he sent me a text a little bit ago. He said, I'm home. I've gained about 20 pounds of water weight. Thanks for all the love and prayers. Hope to see you all real soon. So they appreciate everything that everyone's done to lift them up as they've had to go through this. Uh, just a couple other announcements I want to make. I want to just share that Thursday night was a very good night. We had the, the Yoakum football team come, and they they ate their pregame meal here on Thursday night. They're going to do that every week, hopefully for the next 10 or 12 weeks, not just another eight weeks. That's my plan. But it was great, just a, a good, and I told Coach this in a text, I said, such a good bunch of, of young men, uh, very respectful. They were very appreciative. Uh, they cooked enchiladas for 50, and they were all gone. The boys could eat. So, um, again, that's just a great opportunity for our church to provide a place for them to eat. All we have to do is open the door and sit back and watch them eat. So that's what it, what's a, a great thing that this church is able to do. Uh, we touched on it real quick. Monday night, the prayer walk. Uh, Kelly and I and a few others, we did it Monday. And it's neat just to see the people from all the different churches who want to participate come together. We walk, and at each corner, somebody will lead a prayer or read scripture. Sometimes we walk along, we may recite the Lord's Prayer. But it's praying just for our community, like was said, with the things that are going on, but also our state leaders, national leaders, the world. But most importantly, it's just good to see the different denominations come together and pray for one united goal. To have a better Yoakum, and that's why we're here. And the last announcement I want to make is if you'd ever like to invite someone to come to church, next Sunday would be the day. We're going to make some changes. The, the worship service, uh, I, we met with the deacons Sunday night and came up with some ideas, and it's going to be more universal for everybody. I think everybody's really going to enjoy it. Uh, we were unanimous in our moving forward so if there's somebody that you would like either who's never come or maybe somebody that's come in the past say hey we'd love to have you starting next sunday uh, i know kelly's already she was inviting people at the bulldog football dinner thursday night so if, if you haven't noticed anything about kelly yet she's not ashamed to invite people to church she never has been and that's what i hope that all of us feel like doing our message today is kind of different. Now, I don't know about you, but I love testimonies. I love to hear someone get up and share how God is working in their life. One of the best testimonies I ever heard was years ago. It was on a Wednesday night. There was a gentleman who was in his 80s, got up, and he shared. He said, you know, for my high school graduation, Uncle Sam gave me a cruise halfway around the world to the South Pacific. And he fought the Japanese in World War II there in the South Pacific. And over there is where he found Jesus Christ. And he came back and he shared his life story from, you know, age 18 until in his 80s about how Christ had impacted his life. And that was years ago. And I still remember the heartfelt emotion that he shared that day. The thing I love about testimonies is because when you hear somebody else talk, they've gone through this, and you start thinking, you know what? If they did it, I can do it too. It gives us encouragement, it gives us guidance, and it gives us direction. So today, the title is KOKO, which stands for Keep On Keeping On. Just a little shorthand. Today I'm going to go over kind of the the Cliffs Notes version of the story of Joseph. This is Joseph's testimony to us, what he's learned and the lessons that we can learn from him. And I put down, it's from Genesis 37 through Genesis 50. If you want to read something this week, 
what a great story his life story is. It's, it's well known, and we're just going to touch on some parts of it. And some of these we're going to come back to later as full sermons. But I want us to take it all as a context of how it fits in to the life of Joseph. So let us start with prayer. Lord, thank you for being here with us this morning. Thank you again for the fellowship, for the music, for the prayer, for everything that has happened so far. And now we just pray that each of us will be able to draw on the life of Joseph from what he went through. And he can be an encouragement to us. Then we, when we say, no, we can't, we can look at him and go, yeah, we can. Somebody else has gone through it. We can do it too. So again, Lord, may your word become active in us so that we may take it out and share it with the world. In your name we pray. Amen. First thing we need to do in the life of Joseph is we need to hold on to our dreams. Genesis 37 tells the story about Joseph's dreams. Hold on even when things get hard. Now the dream that he had, this is when he was a young man, a teenager, he dreamt about shocks of wheat and the sun and the moon bowing down and he took that to mean that God had a special plan for his life. My question for you is, what's your dream? Do you have a dream? And if so, what is it? And if you don't have a dream, you need to. And there's a saying that I always used to say, if your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. Okay? We shoot high. We aim high. Dream high. And keep moving toward that no matter what happens. And as we're going to see, Joseph held on to his dream through things that hardly any of us could ever imagine. The problem for Joseph is nobody likes a bragger. And it leads us to our second point about being hurt by those who are close to you. Genesis 37, Joseph is sold into slavery by his brothers. They were going to kill him, but they said, no, we can't kill him, so we'll just kick him down in the hole. We'll take his, his coat of many colors, his technicolor dream coat, whatever you want to call it, and we'll let dad think that you know something happened to him. And they sold him into slavery. He's saying, even if you've been hurt, we still need to keep a good attitude. Because let's be honest, how many of us have been hurt by those that we love that are close to us? Okay? It hurts. It hurts worse than if a stranger. If a stranger hurts you, it hurts. But if a family member or a friend or somebody that you love and trust hurts you, that's like double or triple the amount of pain. So imagine what Joseph went through. His own brothers, his flesh and blood, his kin hurt him so bad. They betrayed him. And they did it because they were jealous. Jealousy is made up of the word lousy. I know some of you are not good spellers. Check it out. It's in there. Jealousy is lousy. Jealousy and self-centeredness are first cousins to each other. Because a jealous person is probably a self-centered person. He or she envies somebody else because they think that whatever's happening to somebody else should be happening to them. That's all it is. His brothers were extremely jealous. And so they did what they did. And that same plague of jealousy can infect our families, our businesses, and even churches. When people become jealous of somebody that they should not be jealous of at all. We should have a heart that we commend those who are excelling or, or doing great things in areas that we cannot. We should learn from the Lord not to be jealous Take the lesson last week. What did Paul do? We talked about he affirmed other people. Paul could do a lot of things, but those things that he couldn't do, he wasn't jealous going, well, I probably could do that too. No, he affirmed them. He said, that's great that you're doing these things. And that's what we need to do. So he was hurt by his brothers. And then later on, I'm just kind of jump ahead. He was in prison and 
he got to be close with Pharaoh's cupbearer, butler type guy, said, hey, when you get out of here, I want you to remember me. Well, the cupbearer got out, and you know what? For two years, he didn't say a word about Joseph. So once again, Joseph was betrayed by someone who was close to him. Again, every single one of us should have raised our hand. I know we've been hurt by those who love us or that we love. So take a lesson from Joseph on how to deal with it. Now, how did Joseph get put in that situation going to prison? Well, it dealt with temptation. Genesis 39, the story about Joseph's temptation. Joseph stayed true to what he believed, to who he was. He basically, he had to keep his integrity. Again, I said this one of the first times I was here. Your reputation is who people think you are, but your character is who God knows you to be. Now, I assume that people would ask, you know, what do you think of Pastor Steve? What's his reputation? I would hope that you would say, oh, he's a pretty good guy. Seems like he, you know, is a good guy, loves his wife, things like that. What if behind closed doors, I was a closet alcoholic, I was cheating on her, and I beat her every other night? See, people can look like they're everything on the outside, but their character is who God knows them to be for real. And our goal as Christians, our reputation and our character should be the same thing. So that if somebody would say, oh, Steve, he's a drunk. They'll say, no, he's not. I know he's not. Because his reputation and his character are the same thing. I use those as very blatant examples because that would never happen. My wife would probably kill me first. <laughs> so, I love you, honey. I'll go back over here on this side. Okay. Integrity is not so much what we do, but integrity is who we are in here. And who we are in here determines what we do. Every single one of us is faced with conflicting desires in our life. Nobody, I don't care how spiritually mature you are, can avoid this battle. And integrity is a factor which is going to tell us which side is going to prevail in this battle. Because we struggle daily with decisions that come from what we want to do or what we ought to do. Every day we are faced with those decisions. This morning, Kelly came home. She brought home some great cinnamon twist donuts. And she said, do you want one? And I said, no. I wanted one. That's what I wanted, but I know I ought not to eat it. And so I said, no, even though down deep, I was like, man, I would eat two or three of those things. Every day we're faced by knowing what we should do. And sometimes it's what we want to do. And sometimes those are not the same. And our integrity is what's going to keep us going in the right direction. It establishes the ground rules for when those things come up that we know what decision to make. So no matter what the circumstances are around us, it frees us up to make the correct decision. And again, we all face temptation daily. There's not one of us that does not face temptation. So the story here in Genesis 39, Joseph was working as a servant at the house of a guy named Potiphar, who was a high Egyptian official. The problem is Potiphar's wife. Now, Genesis 39, verses 9 and 10 says, Joseph was well-built and handsome, good-looking young fellow. Problem Potiphar's wife, well, let's just say this could have been an episode of Young and the Restless thousands of years ago. She wanted to sleep with Joseph. She wanted him. She lusted for him. And he said, no, I can't do this. And he gave the reasons why. And he didn't say, I can't do this because I'd be hurting you. He didn't say I'd be sinning against Potiphar. He didn't even say I'd be hurting myself. He said, if I did this, I would be sinning against God. That's why he said no. And it's easy for us to, to step into temptation. It's very easy. As I like to say, temptation, sometimes we just kind of 
stick our toe in the pool to see how it feels. You know, oh, that's not too bad. And next thing you know, you've fallen into temptation. What Joseph did when he was faced with the ultimate test, Potiphar's wife had sent everybody else home, so it was just those two in the house. And she said, come to me, sleep with me. And he said no. And she grabbed him and tried to pull him to her. He broke free enough that she was left holding his cloak, and he took off and ran. Now, I did a devotion to a football team a few years ago talking about running in the Bible. I said, sometimes we run away and sometimes we run too, and we have to know the difference. Joseph knew at that time he had to run away. He couldn't just say no because that hadn't worked. The only way was to remove himself from the situation, and he ran. But there are other times that we run toward our problems, and I use the example of David fighting Goliath. He had the strength of God behind him, and he just didn't walk up to the battle. He ran to meet Goliath. So sometimes we need to run towards, and sometimes we need to run away, and the wisdom is knowing when and where we need to run. Potiphar's wife accused him of immoral acts. So here he was. He was exposed to extreme temptation. He did the right thing, and what happens? He gets punished. He gets thrown in prison for a crime that he did not commit. Now that would be hard for any of us to take. But this is, again, part of Joseph's testimony. And it leads us to the next thing. He was so honest in prison that the warden trusted him with the keys. What kind of a testimony is that in the, in the reputation and the character of Joseph? I would hope that we would want to be that type of person. That's a testimony to Joseph's character. I would want that for each one of us. That wherever we are, someone would literally trust us with their keys. My question to you, how would people describe you? If you would ask people you work with or in your neighborhood, how would they describe you? Now here's the scary thing. What if you're talking to somebody at work and in idle conversation you say, yeah, we had a, a great day at church yesterday. And their first words were, you go to church? We should live our life in a way that reflects Jesus Christ. If they can't see Jesus Christ living through us, then we're not doing our job as disciples for him. Live our life in a way that glorifies God and is faithful to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So be like Joseph. Your reputation, your character should be one and the same enough that people would trust you with their keys. That's a great analogy. Now this next one's the one, if you're easily offended, you might want to pull your toes back a little bit because I'm going to step on it, okay? Be gracious when you have the power to get somebody back. Let's face it. It's human nature. If somebody hurts you, what do we want to do? We want to, we want revenge. We want to hurt them back. They hurt us. We want to hurt them just as bad, if not worse. They hurt me. I'm going to hurt them. Unforgiveness is a cancer that our soul will carry around. And Joseph was, was able to overcome that cancer, and he forgave his brothers when he had the chance not only to hurt them, he could have taken their lives, he could have had them killed. But his act of forgiveness is a foreshadowing of what Jesus Christ, for, when he forgave his enemies from the cross, what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Joseph could have hurt his brothers, but he didn't. They came for help to him, and he gave them help, and in doing so, he saved the nation of Israel. It's reflected in the New Testament. Jesus tells us, Matthew 5, 39, to turn the other cheek. Oh, man. But God, don't you know what they did? Turn the other cheek. Luke 6, 27. But I tell you, who hear me, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. 
Pray for those who mistreat you. Man, this isn't fun. We want to we want to argue with God. We want to say, but God, they hurt me. Do you know how bad I hurt? I want nothing more than to hurt them back. I'll be honest. It's really hard for me to pray for those who have mistreated me. I've had to work on it. I mean, I'm being transparent up here. It's not easy. That's one of those things that I shared that I need to work on my prayer life. This is one of the things that I've had to be intentional about is that when people hurt me to pray for them. I used to just ignore them, but now I know I need to pray for them. Romans chapter 12, verses 17 through 21. It says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Even at the end of Genesis, after Joseph's father, Jacob, had passed away, the brothers were still nervous because they thought, okay, the only reason that he's not being mean to us is because dad's still alive. Once dad's gone, here it comes. They, just, they were just certain that he was going to inflict his revenge. What, what do we say? Revenge is a dish best served cold. We just let it simmer and then we get him. But Joseph didn't do that. Genesis 50, 19. You meant to harm me, but God intended it for good to help save people's lives. And he not only forgave them, but he reassured them that they would be taken care of through the rest of their life. And in doing so, he preserved the nation of Israel. The next part of Joseph's life is to stay strong even though your dreams are delayed. Because as we've all had to learn the hard way, God's timing and our timing are not the same thing. Amen? Amen. We pray in our time, but God answers in his time. And you think about it. Joseph was either a slave or a prisoner in the prime of his life. For 13 years from age 17 until 30, being a prisoner or a slave. That's not how you want to spend your 20s. We have to wait on God because his timing is perfect timing. It was back in February and March I first sent my resume here to Austin Street Baptist. And I never heard a word. Didn't hear a word back. I was so excited. I kept thinking, this is it. This is the door that God is opening for me and for Kelly. But I never heard a word. But then one day I go up to the church at Platonia, just during the middle of the week, I had to go pick up something for Sunday school. And Pastor Tim looks at me and he says, well, I probably shouldn't tell you this. I don't want to get your hopes up, but somebody from that church in Yoakum called me today and asked about you. I was so excited. I was like, inside, okay, that's cool, that's fine. But man, inside, I was like turning cartwheels. And if you ever see me turn a cartwheel, it's not pretty, okay? <laughs> I was ready to go. I was like, yeah, let's load up the truck. I'm ready to go. Who do I need to talk to? Guess what? Nothing happened for a while. And I've said this before. I praise your search committee that you selected because they did not just jump. They didn't just say, this is what we're going to do. They prayed about it. They worked through. And I know that God was in the process. Again, God's timing not our timing. I would have had the U-Haul packed three or four months ago. But it wasn't supposed to happen that way. What I want each one of us to do is to be ready that when God opens that door for you, whatever it is, to be ready. Maybe that's in a new relationship. 
Maybe that's in a different job or within your job, different responsibilities or a different attitude. Maybe that's in your life choices or your financial matters. The thing is, don't compromise who you are, but stay strong to the person that God wants you to be. Amen? You don't have to be accountable to me. You don't have to be accountable to anybody else, but you need to be accountable to God. The next thing that Joseph would say is to say and do the right things, even when it would be easy not to, or if others around you are doing wrong things. Because it's hard to stay strong and stay headed the right way. Okay, I need some volunteers. I'm just going to grab a few of you. Come over here. Darn, yeah, Sherry, yeah, come on. You get her sitting up front. All right, come on. You guys can come too. All right, come on. Don't be shy. I picked on the boys one time. Now it's your turn. I won't make you guys do it again, even though you failed the egg test. Okay, we're going to go for a walk. Okay, we're just going to walk over this way. We're all walking the same direction. We all have the same ideas. And it's easy to walk. We just kind of go along. Right? And stay right there, please, Sherry. Now, what if that group decides they're going a certain way, but it's the wrong way? I'm Joseph. I want to go the right way. And we start walking toward each other. What happens? Okay? Come this way. Keep walking, everybody. Oh, okay. i got to go around you. No, I... It's hard. You know what? It'd be real easy for me just to fall back. You know what? Forget it. I'll just go with them. But instead, I keep walking through. I know the direction I'm supposed to go. You may go back that direction now. Thank you. <laughs> so easy. And, and I pray. That's why I have such a heart for students. Whether it's in grade school, middle school, high school, even college. Because it is so easy to follow along with the crowd. It is so hard today to walk against the crowd, even when you know it's right. Joseph knew it was right to resist Potiphar's wife. It had been so easy for him to go, you know what? Everybody else is doing it. I'll do it too. But he kept walking against the crowd. Because he knew the way that God wanted him to. So my, my prayer for you is... Know which way God wants you to go and walk that way. I don't care what's coming your other way. If you have to weave around them, even if it takes you a while to get across speed bumps, whatever it is, stay on course, head the right direction. Joseph never gave in to temptation to just do it because everybody else was doing it. He could have gotten angry. He could have done all the things that he could have done, but he didn't. Because he was different. He knew he had a life that was mapped out by God. And guess what? God has a plan for your life too. Amen? Amen. You may not be a biblical hero, but God has a plan for your life. Psalm 105, 19 says, Until the time came to fulfill his dream, the Lord tested Joseph's character. Again, God will never tempt you. Satan, that's his job. But God will test us. God will test us and see how our faith is. He tests us with a little to see if we can handle more. And he did this with Joseph. He gave him tests through his life. And in the end, Joseph became one of the most powerful men in the world. From a slave left for dead to a prisoner to what would be like one of the leaders of the free world at the time, if you want to put it in today's terms. During each roadblock, every hurdle that Joseph went to, he could have said, I quit. That's it. I quit. He could have had a little pity party and just sat down on the floor and said, why me, God? Why? Why does it always have to be me? He could have taken a step backwards. He could have gone in the wrong direction. But he KO KO. Keep on keeping on. He kept putting one foot in front of the other in the direction that God had him go. He shook it off and moved on. Remember the message I gave online last spring about Paul when he had the viper stuck on his hand. He shook it off and he moved on. 
Wherever Joseph went, whatever he did, God was with him and it showed. But most importantly, he did not take any of the credit for it. He gave God all the credit. So when you're going through difficult or tough times, that is what's going to reveal your true character. We always say this in sports that, you know, adversity builds character. No, adversity does not build character. It reveals it. When you're going through that, it shows who you really are. Now, I apologize. Some of you have heard this example before because I used it in the online message, but I want to share it again today because it's so true that there was a daughter who was complaining to her dad about her life and she was tired of fighting and struggling with all these things. It was one problem after another. And her father was a chef. And so he was listening and he said, come on in the kitchen. And he went in and he filled up three pots of water and put them all on the stove and he turned the burners up on high. And then just sat there and waited until the water started boiling. And then once the water started boiling, he put some potatoes in the first pot, put some eggs in the second pot, and then he put some coffee in the third pot. And then they just stood there and watched things boil. Didn't say a word to each other. And of course, daughter's rolling her eyes going, what's dad doing now? <laughs> then after a few minutes, say 15 or 20 minutes, he turned the burners off. He took the potatoes out, put them in a bowl, took the eggs out, put them in a bowl, and he took the ladle and he poured the coffee out into a cup. So he turned to his daughter and says, daughter, what do you see? And imagine a teenage daughter going, duh, I see potatoes, I see eggs, and I see coffee. He says, no, look closer. Look closer at what you see. And she did it. She started to realize that the potatoes were soft, the eggs were hard, and then she sipped the coffee and she smelled that aroma and it brought a smile to her face. And she said, Dad, what's all this mean? He explained that each item, the potato, the egg, and the coffee, each faced the exact same adversity. They all faced the same pot of boiling water. However, each one reacted different. Potatoes, they went, went in hard and rigid and firm. And at the end, they were soft and mushy. The eggs went into the boiling water soft and fragile. And at the end, they came out hard, hard boiled. But the coffee was unique because when it was exposed to the boiling water, it had changed its environment, the water around it, into something new. And so the father asked his daughter, says, which one are you? When adversity knocks on your door, how do you respond? Are you a potato? Are you an egg? Or are you coffee? And that's what I want to ask you today. Are you a potato? Are you an egg? Or are you coffee? We're all going to go through adversity, but are we going to let it make us brittle, or not brittle, uh, soft and squishy like the potatoes? Is it going to make us hard like the egg? Or are we going to change the circumstance that we're in into something new and useful and pleasant? Adversity does not build character. It reveals it. Joseph went through these things. Job went through horrible suffering. And he stayed true to what God had a plan for him. I mean, even his own wife said, just give it up. Just curse God and die. Not spouse of the year material right there. Okay? <laughs> but he knew what he was supposed to do. He stayed true with his faith in God. And, and it paid off in the end. On the other hand, think about the, the people of the nation of Israel when they're wandering around for 40 years. What did they do? They griped. They whined. They complained. They did all these things. And what happened? A whole generation of that nation did not get to go into the promised land. God said, that's the way you want to act. You'll never see the promised land. So they wandered around for 40 years till they all died. And the next generation got to go in. 
Think about the Apostle Paul. He was beaten. He was shipwrecked. He was in prison. All these things happened to him, but he did the same thing Joseph did. Keep on keeping on. Stay on course with what God wants you to do. Because those tough times define those people, either for the better or for the worse. Like our scripture says, until the time came to fulfill his dreams, the Lord tested Joseph's character. He is testing each one of our characters. How are we handling the adversity that comes with us? I had a pastor one time and he used to tell me, he said, God's taking notes. You think that he's not paying attention? God is taking notes. It's Matthew 6, 4. He says, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. My challenge for you today is this. When things get tough, keep on keeping on. Pray, figure out what God wants you to do. Not what you want you to do, because I guarantee you, if you put it all on you, you're probably going to make the wrong choice. But that integrity, when we get to be more like God, that's going to determine what we do when we're faced with those choices in life. So keep on keeping on. Keep straight. Keep going down that road. And just remember, God is taking notes. He knows what you're going through. And in time, your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Amen? Amen. At this time, I want to just give you a chance to respond to what's been said today. Again, the altar is always open. If you want to come up and pray during the invitation song, feel free. If you want someone to pray with you, that's very powerful, too. If you see somebody up here praying... If you just want to come up and lay a hand on them, you don't even have to say a word. That's, that's just as powerful. If you, if you want to talk to me about anything, maybe it's that adversity. Maybe you're in a pot of boiling water right now. And you said, I'm tired of being a potato. And I'm tired of being an egg. I want to be coffee. Let's pray about it. Let's get that started. Maybe you decided that you would like to make Austin Street Baptist Church your church home. I would love to have that happen. Or if you decided that today is the day that you are ready to make that decision to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior. That you finally put your trust in Him. Because in doing so, we'll write your name in the book of life and you will spend eternity in heaven. So as we sing, if God is calling you, come down and let's pray together. Let's talk. And if not, right where you're at, think about the adversity you go through Think about the life that you have had. What have you learned from Joseph? He said, I wish I could have done this different. I wish I would have done this different. And apply that to your life. Amen. <clears throat> Let's pray. Will you stand with me? Lord, thank you again for being with us and giving us examples throughout history. And Joseph is a great example because he went through every emotion and everything that we go through. He was betrayed. He was hurt. He faced extreme temptations. He did the right thing and was still punished. And then he had a chance for vengeance and he didn't because he remembered that that's not his job. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And in doing so, he changed the course of the world, the course of why we're even here today. So Lord, I pray that as we leave here, we will learn from those lessons of Joseph but I also pray if there's anyone here right now that God is that you're working on their heart, that they'll come down and we'll pray about it, we'll talk about it, and we'll move forward. Because that's the best thing about a testimony. We hear somebody else say, I've been through it, you can do it too. Joseph's gone through it. We don't have to be a biblical superhero to know that we can go through it too, because we all serve the same God. We pray these things in your name. Amen.